musically, musically, musically. So they want I to change my identity. Musically, musically, musically. Some music race, commercial race, political race. Our enemies are many, and they stand ready to pounce upon and exploit our every weakness. They play upon our vanities and flatter us in every kind of way. They tell us that this particular person or that particular country has greater or more favorable potentialities than the other. They do not tell us that we should unite that we are all as good as we are able to make ourselves once we are free. I for him on Kaba at the Bafoka TV so and there uh, yeah the black man story Jimmy Dino and the Abbey PMO our Eastern region at Simpoku uh, to be precise born again Africa Ghana so food for a master and the Abbey PMO and then you know the black history month celebration and how to say Foka TV and then the black man story Jimmy Dino yes we are back you have a father life, and so it's me, Eddie Amano. Now, who to any now share a hand said to me say, Jumedian, a Bacoso and Ned Day, you know, and who wants to say, who aim for Niana say, and who your man and also a background, you to me at the air brown. Now, and then, your mind, Bacoso, you know, you didn't have a Bremo life, I will poke at TV. So, to the man, some Mamu could be a mini Franco Suko, yes, Yama, better from the kitty boy, Dublin Jackson, and I feel so no, a Kaku from Pong, a year to K. And I feel so say what could you know or much me a baby boy meeting as a piano it to me at the air bomb life and from at in poke it won't go nine to know the air cost of the video we want therefore to develop our own community and an African personality others may feel that they have evolved the very best way of life but we are not bound like slavish imitators to accept it as our mold. We find the methods used by others are suitable to our social environment, we shall adopt yes. or adapt them. Yes. If we find them unsuitable, we shall reject them.
a Sujaman FM as a radio broadcaster and acting general manager too. So I'm glad to be your host for today's special program. And I'm not the only one going to host this program. Alongside my brother Exodus will be joining me as time goes on. Today's a special day, a Black History Month celebration. And we expect so much happiness from everyone who comes here today. We have great speakers who are going to share with us so much about Africa and also most of them have been in the diaspora for a long time and have lived in Ghana and some parts of Africa too. So I believe with their experience, anybody that comes here today is going to learn so much. And because of language barrier, um, we are in Ghana, Eastern region and Esujaman district, or at Impoku to be precise, we have some of the indigenous here who speak Ki, Eve, Ga, Krobo, and others. But we vary between the English and the Ki. So once a while, I'll try to translate and summarize some of the things that our speakers speak or tell us about in Ki. So without much ado, I'd allow to translate whatever I said in Chi for our brothers who can't really understand the English language to also understand what I mean. Me pa chowa has say na se unte brofwa. Da na me kani ni na ni se me di in the Franco su kujie si ama na me yen centro ni wa yen centro juma na ache ye kakra na me ka born again African study group ne home join in 2016. Ah, intino ene. A year that's from Code Mayanina, say, a Bishian, a before a mammary. Now, you are too inside your fray, a titu P. Ah, Osha, a banana, and so on, or more, I say, or money, ye, a babeche, Sio Hunu, any India, or Monsu Messia, and feet be bria, Motimitina, a brochure, and nothing so Ghana has say. It's a Mumina, a quaba. Once again, you are all welcome to Born Again Africa Ghana so food. Okay. Without much ado, I'll call upon my brother Exodus to give us the opening prayer. Please let's welcome our brother Exodus with a round of applause. Thank you. Please let's pray. Ago, ago, ago. We call upon divine spirit. We call upon divine higher entity to invite divine spirit to come and stay in the heart of us as we are here to start this program. We invite all the energies, all the elements to come and sit with us, to come and open our heart and our minds to accumulate whatever we are coming to learn from our own selves here. We invite higher entities to come and sit with us. So let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart here be acceptable in thy sight. So this we pray. Thank you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, my brother Exodus. Without wasting my time, I'll call upon Ni Ashite. Uh, he's a principal elder. Uh, from the Osu or Teshi, I think Teshi rather, yeah, sorry, Teshi school to pour the libation for us. Okay, please let, let's welcome him with a round of applause. DJ, you can give us music whilst we wait for the water.
wakago mwenye me mwenye ho ni ma ho na ma ho oke aku aku shikomiko aku shikomiko Tatani bo bo mwen no bo shiko I'm sorry I have to speak my language so God can hear me Yeah Nani mo bo no bo mwen ka shiko No bo mwen no bo jele no fie no no ke no fie no no bo ehi Fani ni wa ko ba yo Yeah Akutoni wodi kasi saji wale yenye pe wonye wache boko no shi mbo pe so tenye fe e e fe ni ba ya ni gwa fe ni ba ya o gwa o ni mutumo no ocho ni ni ye ya brenda muhammed ya brenda muhammed ya brenda muhammed na oti wa no wodo mo ne e pa no ba yo bua o o fe no mo fi o ne ye mu ke jo mo ba wo ke no ya ba wo ke jo la ba wo a cho akwe wo no be mi a cho ha wo no be mi jo mo so ya ya no ya ba shi ale se mo ba shi ashi te okay I'll do a little bit translation and summary from what he just did so that we continue. So whilst I do the translation, I think our first guest speaker will be preparing to come. Basically, Ni Ashite was trying to invoke our ancestors uh, and invite them to this particular gathering. So he started by giving appellations and credit to the God Almighty. After that, he invited our ancestors who we did not see but with us. He also invited our mother, Mrs. Brenda Muhammad, spirit, to be with us. He also asked God Almighty to make this program successful, a year by this time, the numbers here should be more encouraging than this. He also seek God's permission to bless Mr. Yazid Mohammed and his wife. He also seek blessings for everyone here. Also, he seek blessings for some of our ancestors that is our black revolutionist, the likes of Nkrumah, if you heard him mention Nkrumah, and other black revolutionists. So basically, that is what he was talking about. And with the last part, he said, some of our ancestors who do not take in alcohol, he saw him pouring out water for them. So in a nutshell, this is what Ni Ashite came to do. By this time around, he was speaking in his native language. That is the Ga Atangbe. Thank you very much. DJ, you can give us a message whilst we wait for the first guest speaker. And our first guest speaker today, I'm very honored to introduce her to you all. She's a founding director of Emerging English Coaching, an online coaching service for English language foreign language and students and teachers. She's been in the TEFL industry for nearly a decade, originally from Chicago. She has lived and taught across the US, the UK, wow. Europe, Asia, and Africa in a variety of roles across many international house networks, includes London, Vietnam, Poland, and Moscow. She is currently in Ghana, West Africa, with her husband, who is a full-time 
online English coaching. Online English T E F L coach. Through Imagine English coaching, she has helped several and hundreds of students advance their English skills. And she has coached many teachers in Africa, Europe, and Asia. With a round of applause, can you help me introduce our first guest speaker for the day, Madame Videl Sinch. I don't know if I got the name right. Welcome, Madame. Welcome. Yes, sir. I love. So thank you. Um, my name is Verdell Sendehia. Um, Mr. Yazid, I don't know who he is. But thank you, Mr. Yazid, for inviting me uh, to share. Um, I don't have so much matured experience as my elders who will precede me, but I like to share from um, what I do have and what I do know. Um, so um, I've been in Ghana for about two years, and I'm naturalizing as a Ghanaian citizen through marriage. As our host mentioned, I've been in the TEFL industry, which stands for TEFL, for nearly a decade. Uh, this industry is teaching English as a foreign language. So anyone who wants to learn how to speak English, you hire a TEFL teacher or a TEFL coach. So I've been doing that, and prior to moving to Ghana, I was doing it. So it only made sense to continue to do what I've been trained to do while living here to sustain myself. And so I'd like to just briefly share on that. What does it look like to practically leave your uh, country that you were born into, if you're part of the diaspora, and to come here um, in a sustainable way without running out of money, right? How do, you, how do you do this? What's the real side of it? Many of us are not coming from well, I can't speak for everybody. I didn't come from a privileged background. Um, I didn't come from being a retiree and having a pension. I didn't come from that. I left the U.S. in my 20s, and I didn't look back. And so I've had a chance to travel to different parts of the world and teach in different parts of the world. Um, being in a long-distance relationship, it only made sense to come to Ghana. If I can live in Asia, if I can live in Europe, I need to live in the motherland. Mm -hmm. And so my transition to Ghana, um, it didn't take a lot of planning. I didn't do years <laughs> of planning. Um, and I think my reasons are different than for some people who are here. I grew up very much uh, Pan-African. My father, you know, at some point he was part of the Nation of Islam. Very, you know, pro-black um, household. Um, but I never, I would say, have been the stereotypical Pan-African person. I'm very intentional and strategic with who I place myself around in representation. And moving here, especially with the whole movement of the return, it's a hype right now. It's a bandwagon. Everybody wants to be in Ghana, and they don't know how to do it sustainably. And we compare ourselves. This person moved to Ghana in this way. This person moved to Ghana in that way. And my biggest form of advice would be you need to identify who you are, why you want to come, whether it be for love, whether it be because you're tired of issues within Europe or the US or the UK, whatever your reason is, let that be for you. And you come here, you, we're, we're placed here. My reasons may be different from you all, but what are we doing while we're here? How are you using your gifts, your talents to benefit the community at large? And so that has been my quest while here. What is my gift? Language, my voice. I monetize it to help me sustain living here. I coach other people on how to do that and how to sustain living here, diasporans or Ghanaians, whatever the case may be. Um, and so that would be my biggest form of advice. Next, I'd say um, it's been a, a, a blessing to interact with community, to interact with people who uh, have been here for years and paved the way for people like me to come. So I really, really appreciate you all. Um, I, I give honor to you all. And it's still a learning process. I can't sit up here and, and pro 
claim <laughs> to have uh, understood Ghanaian culture and culture at large because I don't. I still sit and I observe. I don't believe in coming in and storming and I want to change this, I want to change this. I believe in observing and seeing what's already happening and then how can I participate in what's already going on. Not compete, not, uh, yeah, not compete. That's the biggest thing. Learning how to collaborate amongst the community of diaspora and learning how to collaborate amongst Ghanaian people. Uh, that's been part of my my goal and my mission in these past few years of living here. Um, Ghana is a beautiful country, as many of you all know, but it's not easy. It's not easy. And we can't pretend that it's all just, you know, so easy, but it's, it's easy in the sense that when you've consciously decided to move here, whatever is the, at the root of that decision will keep you despite difficulties, lights out, I don't know, water has stopped running, whatever you may be experiencing, cultural frustrations with time, with communicating, this is supposed to be done on this day and the person delayed, whatever the case may be, your motive and your decision to come here and to be here has to be what keeps you here. And using the gifts that you already have and adapting it to this culture and this environment will help you to sustain being here, right? And I believe, yeah, those are some of my big lessons with living in Ghana and some of my uh, big lessons that I can give encouragement to people who want to be in Ghana, right? So whatever you're doing now in your home country, how can you use that in Ghana? How can you adjust it to Ghanaian culture, right? Don't compare yourself to what other people are doing, how they're doing things. Everyone's pocketbook isn't the same size. Stay in your <laughs> lane. <laughs> you know, sometimes you can't do certain things. And it's important to learn how to stay in your lane or otherwise you will exhaust yourself, exhaust your resources, um, and learn to work together, come together, collaborate, um, yeah, that's all I have to share. I like to keep it brief, strong, not long. <laughs> Thank you. We're, we're expecting the next guest speaker with so few music. He has read philosophy, political economy, history, among other subjects in Eastern Europe, within the year 1982 to 1985. He studied journalism, public relations, Advertising and Marketing at the Ghana Institute of Journalism in 1988 to 1989. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, help me welcome Ni Ashite Buku, our next speaker. Oh, Mother Africa. Mother Africa. Whether or thou drifting. You, who used to be the cradle of civilization. You, who used to be the citadel of learning. You, who used to have universities in Asian Mali, Ghana, Sudan, Lefe, Songhai, etc. You who built the pyramids that defied European knowledge and understanding. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly, Mother Africa, you have become silent mm. and leaderless. Where are the Shaka the Zulus? Where are the Abdel Kamen Nazis? Where are the Julius Nereris, the Inam the Azikiwis, the Kaundas, the Bembelas, the Bembakas, the Kenyatas, the Secretaries, the Modibo Kators? What happened? Where are you? Yes, go you must. But how did you go? And what heritage did you leave? For posterity. Surely, 
there must be a redemption. So come at the hour, come at the man. So come at Kwame Nkuma to the rescue. Come at Kwame Nkuma to liberate and unite Africa politically and economically. Come at Kwame Nkuma to liberate and integrate Africa for her common good, heritage, and destiny. But Akwasi Bruni saw this. Akwasi <laughs> Bruni saw this and said, hey, this man is a threat to us. This man will spoil our show. This man will spoil the game. Get rid of him. So 24 February 1966, coup d'etat in Ghana. And everything stopped. Everything changed. And Africa became leaderless again and began to drift. Economic and political liberation and integration faded away. And Africa continued to eat crumbs from colonial masters' tables. Oh, you may say Kwame Nkrumah left behind the African Union. <laughs> the African Union. The African Union is only a talking shop. It's only a talking shop where African leaders wear three piece suits and try to look more than the possible. <laughs> Speak Oxford English and Buckingham Palace English and pat each other on the back for human rights abuses and for looting and stealing their country's money and saving them in foreign countries. That is the African Union left behind by Kwame Nkrumah. Wake up, African leaders. And stop looking up onto the hills and mountains from where you think your economic and political salvation will come from. Your economic and political salvation it's on the ground, not in the hills and the mountains. Don't be deceived and be distracted. Economic and political salvation comes from unity, integration, willpower, purposeful direction, selflessness, action, and not drinking tea and speaking Buckingham Palace English. Uh, yeah. And try to look more than Kwesi Prumi himself. <laughs> Don't we have any more Kwame Krumas? Don't we have any more Samora Marshalls? No more Augusta Natos? No more such people? They're here. They're here. I believe we have. So where are you? Come out of your closets, African leaders. For your people, need you for their emancipation and freedom from hunger and starvation and poverty and lack of schools and hospitals to water and shelter hmm. i don't mind if you eat with question i don't mind if you die with him but you must do so with a long spoon even if a shovel to be better if you want to die with question and if he asks you to look up, you better look down. Our ancestors are watching and they are grieving. They are grieving. Get up, African leaders. There's a battle to be fought and there is a battle to be won. Get up. Stand up. Stand up for you. Get up. Respect, my Lord. Don't give up the fight. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It's called wow. about an African American lady called Quay Noki. Quay Noki. An African American lady called Quay Noki. Who was told that the name Quay Noki comes from Ghana and from a place? In the Katami area. So, Queen 
what he said now to go and look for his her, sorry her roots queen of the second so he set out to go and look for her roots queen of came about three times but could not find the name some names are very popular and some names are addresses forgive me if i say this but i'm in katangwe and anytime you call my name i can be traced to my room easily easily just call my name i should take anywhere and you trace me to my rooms. unfortunately some names are very popular and some names are not kwee noki is not a popular name but it comes from the katangwe area so kwee noki came looking for her roots and did not find it but three times she decided that she won't come back anymore she was tired but there's a spiritual idea that say that when the student is ready the master will appear yes, sir. Yes, sir. on her last day when she had decided that she was not going to come anymore something happened at the airport she met a discerning knowledgeable and observant immigration officer who looked at her paper and looked at her face i said madam you look you look american you don't look like a Ghanaian. but your name is a Ghanaian name your name queen noki is a Ghanaian name but you don't look like a Ghanaian. and queen noki responded yes that's why i'm here that's why i'm here i was told that i'm a Ghanaian, or my name is a Ghanaian name so i've come looking for my name but finally i can find the name so i'm going back this is the last time i'm not coming back here Okay. So the immigration officer told her, you can find this name at a place called Ningo. Ningo near Pram Pram, the Katangwe district. But at that time, one of Queen Oki's foot was already in the aircraft. One of, was just waiting to be carried into the aircraft for her to go away. So she made a promise. She made a promise that she was going to go and come back again and look for Ningo and for the Queen Oki family. And she did. You can be sure what happened. You can be sure. You can imagine what happened. She went back to the United States, put herself together, and came back to Ghana and went to Ningo. And the ancestors. The ancestors sent her straight to her home, which she had left 500 years back. Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah. Yes. The ancestors did that. And there was joy, there was jubilation, there was excitement. And I wasn't there, but I read it 50 years back. I was so happy myself. Now, with this story, there was a realization. There was a realization. Something happened to me. And can anyone here tell me what realization came to me? Can anyone tell me? Anyone willing to share with us what happened to me? Well, if, if there's no uh, attempt, then I'll tell you what happened to me. It dawned on me, it, I realized that anybody, anybody without a root is lost. Anybody without a root is lost. That was the realization. So, what can I do? What can I do in my own small way 
to help my brethren, the African Americans in the diaspora, to make a home here. Because they keep going and coming as tourists because there's no place they can call their home. Are you getting me? Come on, the place is too quiet. Maybe I'm not making sense. We are with you. My vision, my dream. Something happened. The murder of Sister uh, the yes. That stole everything. Why? I'm sorry to say this. But brothers and sisters at the coast and Elmina had a feeling that the murder was committed by Brother Yazid and Mother and those of the young crowd here. We brought a wedge between those at the coast and Elmina and those here. And that's all. Because, I'm sorry to say, Mm -hmm. uh, my brothers, uh, African Americans, are very strong feelings. They are very strong passwords. Uh, they don't forget this, I'm sorry to say. They don't forget this. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, is that correct? They don't forget this. And so, I haven't been able to bring them together to uh, put them in. was my dream and I'm attempt to find a home for our brothers in the diaspora. This is my story. Now, yes, I Mr. E. Ashite was wonderful every time. Yes, sir. Now, the last segment, I have three segments, the poem, and then not this story, and the last segment is all the obstacles, the hindrances we have gone through in trying to make repatriation and emancipation successful. One, I don't say it was structured, it's still structured in a way that I learned everything about Europe and United States and everything, but not Ghana. I learned about all the things and kings of England. Even that amorous things, uh, you know him. Uh, I think the weather is not favorable, so we will not waste much time. Um, what we we'll do is we just have some short uh, break. I think the food is ready. Yeah, the food is ready. So we have some short break. When we come back, we continue. But before we go. Uh, I want you all to look back. Uh, there's a nice setup there. That is Exocraft. Uh, if you want powerful African prints, uh, it is designed by our brother Exodus. And, yeah. And, 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 and Nana Bako. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you board. very much. Uh -huh. So, whilst we go out there and have our food, you can also take a glance through some of the African prints and you can buy some. Let's patronize black business that is black empowerment too when we come back we are going to have a poem from abigail uh Agbenyo. beautiful yeah and also we have a senior lecturer in our mix who's also going to educate us more we have one uh is a businessman a poultry farmer and also a leader of the Ghana Diaspora Advocacy and Resource Foundation. He'll also be speaking to us. So DJ, uh, give us music as we go for the food. Thank you.
week. Let's continue with the program and we start with a poem from Madame Abigail Agbenyon. I go by the name Abigail Agbenyo and a student. My poem is entitled African Ladies. Oh my dear African ladies, you are black and beautiful. You are the shining star of the African continent. I love your natural color, the black color. Oh my dear African ladies, bleaching is not good. Let black be black and white be white. We have been blessed with a beautiful color. We thank God for our beautiful color. Oh my dear African ladies, I love you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, without much I do. Okay, I'll call upon our next guest speaker. He's a senior lecturer. He's a senior lecturer from the University of Environment and Sustainable Development, the Department of African Studies. He's also with the School of Natural and Environmental Science, the Department of General Studies. He's also the leader of proofreading units at the University of Environment and Sustainable Development. He was an associate professor at the Area and Global Studies at Grand Valley State University, Michigan, US, where he served as a coordinator of the program in African and African American Studies. He also served as associate executive editor of the Africanology, a journal of Pan-African Studies. He is the author of Travel and the Pan-African Imagination, a book that was released in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, help me welcome Dr. Makutam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I hope that you are all well. Uh, first, I would like to begin by thanking Brother Yazid Mohammed for inviting me to be a speaker at this August event. As an academic who has worked for over two decades in higher education, the opportunity for community engagement is one that I always appreciate. So thank you, Brother Yazid. And I thank all of you for taking the time to listen to me today. At the outset, I think that it is important for us to understand what our ancestor, the historian Colin A. Palmer, referred to as the five major African diasporic screams that occurred at different times and for different reasons. According to our ancestor, Professor Palmer, quote, the first African diaspora was a consequence of the great movement within and outside of Africa that began about 100,000 years ago. The second diasporic scream began about 3,000 years before the Common Era, or BCE, with the movement of the Bantu-speaking peoples from the region that is now the contemporary nation of Nigeria and Cameroon to other parts of the African continent and to the Indian Ocean. The third major scream, which I characterize loosely as a trading diaspora, involved the movement of traders, merchants, slaves, soldiers, and others to parts of Europe, the Middle East and Asia beginning around the fifth century BCE. The fourth major diasporic scream and the one that is most widely studied today is associated with the Atlantic trade in African slaves. And finally, the fifth major scream began during the 19th century, particularly after slavery's demise in the Americas and continues to our own times." End quote. Thus, when we speak of the African diaspora, we are making reference to black African world community formations on a global scale, encompassing black African people inside and outside of the African continent. Nearly 23 years ago, in the summer of 2001, 
I first visited Ghana as a 23-year-old PhD student at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and as a part of a women's health in the city of Accra Research Collective, which was a joint project between the University of Michigan and the University of Ghana, Legon, that was based at the Institute of African Studies at Legon. For two and a half months, I lodged in the compound of a Ghanaian family in Medina while serving as the chief editorial assistant for research papers that were written by graduate students from Ann Arbor and from Legon. My time at IAS and in the greater Accra metropolitan area with occasional trips to Elmina and Cape Coast was a life-changing, insightful, experiential introduction to the life, to life on the continent, our ancestral homeland. Now, according to a Mamprusi proverb, the bat says it's better if it delays and goes home with a ripe shea nut than to go home with a raw shea nut. Almost 13 years ago, I was advised by a Senegalese mentor and editor that my desire to work in a Ghanaian institution of higher learning would require patience and should be postponed in order for me to undergo at least 10 years of professional development, namely due to the social, economic, political, and cultural adaptations required for African diasporic permanent entry into the Ghanaian society and academy. I was attracted personally to the idea of living and working on the Afri African continent ever since I was introduced to the Black History Movement and the Black Studies Movement in the late 1990s during my undergraduate studies at a historically black college and as a student intern for the Journal of Negro History that was founded in 1916 by our ancestor, the historian Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who also organized Negro History Week in 1926, which is the origin of Black History Month celebrations today. It is worth noting that according to a Google Arts and Culture online exhibit by the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History and National Postage Museum that is titled The Genesis of Dr. Carter G. Woodson's Negro History Week, quote, the eminent scholar and social activist, as well as repatriate to Ghana, W.E.B. Du Bois, lauded Negro History Week as the greatest achievement to arise from the black renaissance of the 1920s in his 1940 book, Dusk of Dawn. As it had turned out for me, after completing a PhD in history in 2010, and after 10 years of work as a visiting tenured track and later tenured black studies uh, professor at a historically white public university in Michigan, and with protracted visits to Ghana as well as Namibia and Kenya, my dream of permanently coming home to the motherland ultimately began to materialize. In 2021, I joined the University of Environment and Sustainable Development, UESD, in Somania, which is the newest, which is the newest public university in the Republic of Ghana that was founded in, 19, in 2020. I joined them as a senior lecturer in African studies. I came home because I wanted to be a part of building, of the rebuilding of continental black African civilization. My research teaching and writings on African nationalism and pan-Africanism provided a foundation for my activism as a scholar, as I consider teaching and writing to be among the most viable, nonviolent means of one social protest against and the ending of injustice and number two, the achievement of sustainable development. Now, almost 100 years ago, Dr. Carter G. Woodson wrote that, quote, history shows that it does not matter who is in power or what revolutionary forces take over the government. Those who have not learned to do for themselves and have to depend solely on others never attain any more rights or privileges in the end than they had in the beginning. This he wrote in The Miseducation of the Negro, published in 1933. My move to the Republic of Ghana in 2021 was not to abdicate responsibility as a black African studies scholar. 
who was born and raised in the USA slave trade, or what some of us refer to as the European crime against African humanity. My move was also a part of my refusal to directly contribute to the building of the white-dominated nation, the USA. Over the years, I have been fortunate enough to integrate as a member into the Mamprusi ethnic group in northern Ghana. In August 2022, for example, I was named Mankutum during a ceremony that was attended by community members of the Wungu traditional area. Mankutum means um, I will never forget or I will always remember. As the Mamprusi say, the well-meaning man thinks in his own favor. In other words, charity begins at home. Now, the issue of embracing African names and African naming practices is just one of the many significant factors related to our need to re-Africanize and to the making of black history. There are a number of black African people who lament the large numbers of black thinkers, scholars, and activists who did not opt to Africa. Where can I eat better food than this? That was that house Negro. In those days, he was called a house nigger. And that's what we call him today because we've still got some house niggers running around here. And if someone comes to you right now and says, let's separate, you say the same thing that the house Negro said on the plantation. What do you mean separate? From America? This good white man? Where are you going to get a better job than you get here? I mean, this is what you say. I ain't left nothing in Africa. That's what you say. Why you left your mind in Africa. Leaders such as Malcolm X viewed repatriation of black African people to the, in the USA to Africa as a psychological and cultural possibility instead of actual physical migration. And this was despite his knowledge that to use his words from a 1963 interview at the University of California at Berkeley, quote, the propaganda of the American government is skillfully designed to make our people think that our people back home don't want us. Government propagandists tell us constantly, Africa is a jungle. Africans are savage and backward. They have no modern conveniences and you're too much like us white folks. How could you live comfortably back there?" Unquote. Most non-academic narratives regarding going back to Africa remain historical tidbits, or more recently, they are often determined by the organizational structures of study abroad experiences, field research, tours, and occasional visits. Now, the influence of Malcolm X on the development of black African studies academic programs in colleges and universities is well noted in the historical record. The 1960s birth and growth of Africology departments, also variously called African Studies, Africana Studies, African American Studies, Pan-African Studies, African Diaspora Studies, and African and African American Studies departments across the USA has arguably played the biggest role in reorienting black African consciousness of Africa. And the institutional proliferation of these centers of African-centered knowledge production, mainly at predominantly white institutions of higher education across the USA, presents 21st century black African scholars with the opportunity to carefully engage the contention that African-centered scholarship or what they call Africology, is the actual Afrocentric study of African phenomena, and that it is African-centered in form and function. Specifically, locating Africa at the center of theory and practice is interrogated in this project in an effort to determine the possibilities of achieving a holistic conceptualization of black African studies, one that is centered in continental Africa. The push-pull factors that will be measured through uh, this project takes place through a set of two questions. Why are most black African-centered scholars still based at institutions of higher learning in the USA instead of in the African Academy? Number two, what drives the decisions of African-centered scholars to work in Africa? According to the repatriate 
to Ghana and Associate Professor of African Studies, Obadele Bakari Kambon. In quote, in short, our behavior is directly attributable to what, to who we say we are. Our possibilities are governed by our identities. When you repatriate to Ghana or elsewhere in contemporary Kemet, or the land of, or the black nation, or the land of the blacks, you also have the choice to focus on the river or to focus on the rivulet. One must choose wisely. Physical and conceptual repatriation are different from the mainstream knowledge production of most black African academic research activity or travel narratives or tours of the African continent. Besides using historical research and Afrocentric research Thank you, methodology, the club. beautiful. Thank you very much, Dr. Bakutam. Um, at this stage, I'd like to introduce our next guest speaker because we don't have much time. He's a Ghanaian and he's a poultry farmer by profession. He's also the leader of Ghana Diaspora Advocacy and Resource Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Mr. Kwame Ochre Dakon. They are both themselves now buying land and selling land. He said, look, I wouldn't talk to a diaspora, ask a diaspora to buy land. I will ask you to lease their land. It is far, 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 far. far. About uh, uh, last year in October, I leased 20 acres of land for just 2,000 Ghana For 50 years. Hey. <laughs> then I got to the community again. When they heard I was around, because I was using the land for diaspora to give you one permit. So these are, there are ways and opportunities to survive in Ghana. If you don't get somebody to hold your hand, show you where you are, you actually will not make it in Ghana. Some of us even in Ghana find it very difficult. Here you are, you don't have a family here, you don't have a, uh, a somebody you can easily rush to for support. So I will I plead with all of you to actually come on board. Uh, we are open to have uh, experienced people to come on board so that they could help us advocate uh, for the diaspora in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Our next uh, guest, wonderful speaker, Time is not at our side, so quick, quick, you know, please. Uh, Dr. Aka, you know, a retired pro pro professor from the University of Mali, all the way from Mali, you know. Let's give him some Yes, Father, welcome. Yes, Father, welcome. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'm coming to share a little bit my experience in Europe and Africa. I'm a Ghanaian. I was born in Ghana here. I studied here. And I left Ghana to go to Europe to acquire knowledge. I went to Germany. I studied German language for about three years. I started to study philosophy, Karl Marx. I studied Marxism for 10 years in Hamburg University. After acquiring my degree, I went to England to do law, four years law. After finishing the law, I decided to come back to Africa because I saw that acquiring all these degrees and experience in Europe, I have to come home and share the ideas with my brothers and sisters. When I was in Ghana here, I didn't know about Ghana. The first coup d'etat in Ghana, 1966, we were fooled by military government that Kwame Nkrumah was bringing mercenary. Kwame Nkrumah was bringing uh, armed production. Kwame Nkrumah was not a good man. 
I'm in Zima man. I belong to the ethnic of Zima, Kwame Nkrumah. Yes, I'm in Zima. My name is Professor Kofi Aka. I'm from the same hometown with Kwame Nkrumah. So we were deceived by Kwame Nkrumah. We didn't know about Kwame Nkrumah. So when I went to Europe, I joined a study group. Through the study group, they started to enlighten me about Ghana and what is going on in Ghana, the socio-economy of Ghana, the people in Ghana. So I started to learn from the study group. Within the study group, I met a lot of Ghanaians. They started to tell me about Ghana. I was very moved. I read 13 books of Kwame Nkrumah. Nkrumah was not only Nkrumah, he was a messiah. Nkrumah was a very great man. So when I came to Africa, I decided to go and follow the footsteps of Kwame Nkrumah. Nkrumah was in Mali to set up Ghana Guinea Mali Federation. So I asked myself why Kwame Nkrumah went to Mali. I discovered that Nkrumah wanted to unite Ghana, Mali, and Guinea. So he set up Ghana, Guinea, Mali Federation. So I went to Mali. Before then, I've read about Mali. The first university in West Africa was in Mali, called University San Kori. That was the first university where the Greeks, the whites, were coming to learn astrology. So I started to teach German language, French language, English language in the Hamburg University. And then I started to teach Mali University called Bamako. I taught for 12 good years in university in Mali. I received my professorship from Mali University. From there, I started to learn more about Africa and Ghana. So I know more about Africa, I know more about Ghana. And I'm very glad that I could come back to Africa, go and part my knowledge with the Africans in Mali. In Mali, I discovered that Kwame Nkrumah was very powerful and great man. Nkrumah was the one who wanted to free the whole Africa. Without Nkrumah, we don't even have electricity. Akosombo. For example, Akosombo was brought by Kwame Nkrumah. So to me, Kwame Nkrumah was not only Kwame Nkrumah, he was a Messiah. I learned a lot about Kwame Nkrumah. I read a lot about Kwame Nkrumah. The first Nkrumah. one they call the brain drain. Anybody for me with the brain drain? Anybody, anybody? The brain drain? So just to give a little example, right? During the enslavement of African people, we were forcibly taken away. The teachers, those who were technical, who had skills, the farmers, right? We were forcibly, forcefully taken away. Well, guess what happened? After our enslavement and during colonialism and post-colonialism, or post the uh, conventional colonialism, many Africans voluntarily left Africa. And these were usually the best and the brightest, the smartest, why? To get a quote unquote education in Europe, to get a quote unquote education in America. Unfortunately, many of them didn't return to Africa, like my elder here who said he went, got the knowledge and what? return that. Many of them spend 30, 40, 50 years in America, give their best time and energy, and maybe now as they get older, they may come back after they retire. Now, I'm not knocking anyone who comes back after they retire or who has gotten that information, but many times Africa needs, right now, we need strong soldiers and warriors to be here and put our time in. So I made a conscious effort 
that I wanted to make sure my best days will be here in Mama Africa and my intellectual property. Because guess what? If I'm a doctor and I go to America and I'm a, I, I'm a doctor at a hospital in America, I'm, I can come up with the best the cure for cancer. That's going to, I might end up helping to save some people that come from their lineage that oppress and enslave my ancestors. Instead of what? Taking that knowledge here and helping to cure and alleviate diseases here in Mama Africa. So that's the brain drain that we voluntarily left Africa for America when our ancestors were forcibly left. So what Muammar Gaddafi wanted to do is what he called creating the brain gain. How can we have African people to return? That was 2011. Now, interestingly enough, if anybody remembers what was going on geopolitically at the time, there was something else, a big thing happening in Northeast Africa, especially the place called Kemet. Anybody remember what happened in 2011? Anybody who studies? The uprising, the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring. So imagine this. Let me just, I'm, I'm in Libya now. I was there like seven days. Anybody know Cynthia McKinney? Big up Cynthia McKinney. I was there with Cynthia McKinney in a delegation. Um, Malcolm Shabazz, Malcolm X, my brother mentioned Malcolm X. I was there with Malcolm X's grandson. And interestingly enough, Farrakhan's grandson was also there. That's a whole nother story. But when we were there, I'm watching on the news. I'm in Libya now. And if you know geographically where Libya is, it's in between Kemet and I think, what, Algeria? Am I right? Or either Tunisia. It's in between one. So I'm in Kemet. Three things happened while I was there. One, Africa's newest country was formed. Anybody know who, what Africa's newest country is? South Sudan, South Sudan was formed. I'm, I'm watching it on BBC. That's one. Two, the president of Tunisia, I think, was overthrown. And then three, literally, as I'm leaving, they begin these protests in Kemet. When I came back to America after spending eight days in Libya, I told my wife, I said, I just got from Libya. I said, if they do anything in Libya, if they talk about any bombing or any chaos, it has to be a government plant. Because when I traveled to Libya, literally when we got off the plane, there were nothing but hot, uh, skyscrapers and um, cranes, 30 to 40 along the highway as I'm driving, all new development. There was a brand new Marriott that was being built in the hotel next to me. Matter of fact, at the time, petrol, we know petrol is high in Ghana. At the time, it was $4 a gallon in the U.S. In Libya, petrol was seven cents per gallon. Let me say that again. Seven cents per gallon. That's how much the fuel was to ride your vehicles. Why? Because Libya had its own oil refinery. Additionally, the Italian government had paid reparations to Libya because of colonialism. So when I saw these things, I said, hold on. They don't want this whole week. October 2022, so we're open for business. My brother, I definitely want to connect with you doing the work in sustainability in Somalia. I've heard about the, the, the university there. I definitely want to see how we can make more connections. Um, but we've been doing similar work in Atlanta. That's where I was based before I came here to Ghana um, around organic agriculture, health and nutrition through our organization Habasha, helping Africa by establishing schools at home and abroad. We just celebrated our 20th, 21st anniversary. Um, and again, we're excited. I was fortunate enough um, to be granted citizenship in December 2022, um, along with over 100 other Africans from the diaspora. Um, we just got our passports. Literally, we, and so I'm, this is the last thing I'm gonna say, but this is funny. In America, you know, um, there's a big push about people from Mexico and others living in America illegally. Well, guess what? Me and my wife, we can say it now. We was living in I'm going to close out by saying this. I'm grateful to be here. Definitely, the Kwaku Ando Sustainability Institute is here. It's for African people. It's for our healing. It's for our learning. We want to continue to build. Um, feel free. I probably will be leaving shortly after we've been on the road for a while, but I definitely want to come and support my brother Yazid. Big up, Yazid. Please show this brother some love. He's an example. A family man, a brother who's doing business, employing people. That's what the diaspora is doing. We're coming to build. We're coming to help expand. Because half of the story hasn't been told. We are that half, and we need our other half, our brothers and sisters. We need this Pan-African unity. This is the way forward. 
events like this are the way we move forward. So I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak and to hear others. I definitely want to connect with many that I've heard. Continue to do the good work. Let's continue to bring our children up in Mama Africa. Let's continue to bridge these gaps. Let's continue to de dispel the myths of what Africa is, right? We know that it's our time. The UN, UN even said it, from 2015 to 2024 is the year of people of African, the decade of people of African descent. So we're not relying on the UN to tell us, but we know this is our time. Year of return, beyond the return, this is our time. So let's be intentional. Everybody who's here that's from the diaphragm, it's for us to each one reach one. Bring a brother or sister home. Bring a brother or sister home. Our goal is to see and to create structures where we can return home, not only here in Ghana, but throughout the African continent and help to rebuild Africa. That's my goal. That's my purpose on life. So again, I give thanks and I appreciate everyone allowing me to speak. All right? Blessings. Okay. Our last speaker, she's the founder of Akosia and Associates, an African diaspora travel, a repatriation and relocation coaching consultancy based in Accra. She provided both on the ground guidance and advice about how best to plan a successful exit from the Americas to Africa for over 17 years. She is well known for the starting a support platform called Sisters in Progress of Moving to Ghana, a Facebook group with over 1K registered diaspora women in the process of actively relocating to Ghana. She is also a graduate of University of Massachusetts. Ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, let's give it up for Madame Akosia Sewa. So thank you to Boca Television. Thank you to all of you. I know we've been here for a minute now. Um, shout out going out to uh, Brother Kashan Hab Habershaw Foundation. Also to Brother Yazid. A lot of us, we all came together over, let's say, a 20-year span. So many of us have been grinding. Um, I think one of the things that make me unique is I'm one of the few females that have been at this for a long time. So I can remember us having conversations in Atlanta, um, conversations and many, uh, we were there at Georgia State University trying to corral the Ghanaian community in Atlanta, Georgia and surrounding areas to even bridge the gap before we start, to have those cross-cultural dialogues before we started. So I'm excited to be here. So I am Nana Akusia Sewa Seoyo, uh, the first. I have been in Seoul for about two years now. My outdoor was actually back in 2009, but in a place called Ijisu Abanasi. Uh -huh. So if you haven't heard of Ijisu, it is the home of um, our fierce warrior queen mother, Yasantua. And um, it is also, let's say, the seat of Mensha Palace. So a few things that I've learned. Um, the Asante Kingdom is organized almost like um, let's say, a military strategic um, formation. Ajisu is the, um, if Ashanti Kingdom should go to war, Ajisu is the, almost let's say, for lack of a better word, the lieutenant that leads Ashanti Kingdom into war. But within Ajisu, Ajisu Abanasi, Abanasi is the one that leads Ajisu. So where I hold my seat at, is in a location where the women, especially, um, sit at the table and making those decisions. And Abenasi being the person that leads Ejisu, that leads the Asante Kingdom, if war should come. So it's not something I take lightly. It's a huge responsibility, and that's where I'm based at. I guess today I'm here to talk about my um, 20 years plus 
living in Ghana as a bicontinental. And I was hoping the professor would stick around because I actually um, wanted to push back a little about this notion of Africans and African Americans. Um, and I believe when I first came to Ghana, I too was struggling at what is an African versus what is an African American. And changed my name, Kusia. Um, it's hardly for you to see me in Western clothing. Um, totally drank everything African. But over my journey, and this is my personal story, um, there is something historically unique about Africans or black people living in America or living in the Americas that's different from everybody else in the whole wide world. And what I have to say, or um, what I've learned is that unless you walk that walk, you really don't really kind of understand it. So when I'm here with my continental brothers and sisters, we can relate, yeah, and we can unify, but it's still a difference in terms of our historical unique experience and how it has made us versus the neo-colonialism that is here in Africa. Sure. And we can talk about that, but personally me, I'm African American, not so much that I'm holding on to the America, but I am very much, very much connected to my ancestors that have fought and fought and fought and fought and made it possible for us to even return to Africa. So I'm standing here today on the shoulders of my ancestors, Thomas Jefferson Huddleston. My grandfather's name is Christopher Columbus Huddleston. Um, and my grandfather, I'll say you can, my great grandfather, you can just Google him. My cousin who changed his name, Yusuf Latif, who's a Huddleston, um, the Espies that um, the former Secretary of Agriculture under the Clinton administration. We have a very rich, rich, rich cult, uh, history and culture. And if having the America attached to our name is the way that we're gonna hold on to it, then I'm holding on to it. So I told him we could, we could have tea, we could have lunch, we could dialogue. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm Nana Akusia. Um, say why say oil. I'm born in Mississippi, Gulfport, Mississippi. I grew up in the Northeast um, in Massachusetts. Um, went to mostly PWIs. I'm a student of the African American Studies Department at um, W.E.B. Du Bois. I think you were talking a little bit about Africulture, sir, during your speech. And um, I was reminiscing on much of the, um, many of the narratives and the stories that I've sat at the feet of my elders and they've shared about building that department, the African American, the W.E.B. Du Bois African American Studies Department, where I live at. is actually about 45 minutes from Great Barrington from where he was born. So um, I went to school there. I've been in the military um, for some time and I'm an educator. I'm a licensed superintendent in the state of Massachusetts and Georgia and in Maryland and I'm an educator for the most part. I first came to Ghana 2003 as a Fulbright Scholar, um, and my research was on engendering the sciences, the STEM fields. Um, from that research, I went on to develop the Girls Institute of Science and Technology, which is an NGO, and that was based in the Ashanti region. That morphed into schools in the Ashanti region, two of them. Um, one was a K through JHS school in Agogo, and then we built, a, we had a high school in Ijisu, which is where my connection to Ijisu come from. Um, I owned and operated those schools for about 13 years. Um, and after 13 years, uh, my baby sister passed away and left five children. And then I had to take a break from being in Africa, go back to America, um, because my reality was about the fact that she left five children and they needed to be cared for. So I went back to the U.S. year anniversary State of my landowner. Um, we called, the whole community called him the old man. He lived to be 100 years old 
and today we had his um, first um, 100th anniversary. Well, it was important for me to be there because he's now gone. So since he has a nickname for me, it's his firstborn. It means it's kind of like the firstborn foreigner, the firstborn diasporan that he'd ever dealt with. So when I came to um, the one year today, earlier today, I was among the family members asking questions. They was asking who I was and I was also um, humbly introducing myself to let them know that no, 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 I'm here and I'm among. And that's just, again, it's almost like a rite or a ritual. It's so important that if this is my land and if I am going to be living among in this community, then they should know who I am. So um, I apologize, but that is the reason why I was late today. So um, with Acusia and Associates, I just wanted to speak briefly. Those are the support services that I provide for um, young people. And it's not for everybody. There's some people, I'm gonna send them right over to the, old, the, the other brother that was speaking earlier. Um, those individuals I normally support have made the decision that they're gonna be here already. We're not like guessing, we're not, they're not still trying to convince themselves. They're not really, um, they've made a decision. Um, whether or not their family agrees or not, they, they, they've taken the first step. So where I am is trying to sort of like hold their hands to help them avoid the landmines, to help them ask the questions. Sometimes this includes the young people, the young women that come and they, they fall in love and they meet their African friends and they want to get married. And it's funny because nowadays I see Yazid is also offering those um, private investigation services. This is so important. I met a lady on the plane and this is when I made a decision to do it. She said she had just come from Ghana, we were going to the, the US, the battle line. And she said her daughter got married to somebody, but she was leaving feeling uneasy because she really didn't know like the family. She was happy for her daughter. So when she was talking to me, and as I listened to the story, I was like, oh my goodness, these, they got got. And they got got me. Um, we do have young people that are just kind of looking for a way out. And if that means through the diasporan sister that is whose heart is wide open because she's just come to Africa for the first time and the brother has held her bag and he's, you know, calling her queen and he's just affording her every humble courtesy that we don't get in America. Um, she's in love, you know, he says, oh, I love you and I love you and now there's a marriage. And so I have to have them ask the question, well, sister, who did you meet from the family? Did you meet the family head? And the mother said, no. I said, hmm. I said, okay, well, what's the dowry? See, the dowry is big, because you got to come with something in the culture, right? I said, well, how much money did you get? I just kept it real. How much money did you get? Where's your envelope? She said, money? They give you money? I said, okay. I said, okay, um, okay, so who, let's start with who are the women in the family? And so we, we kept going with the questions and it just becomes obvious um, that it didn't look like a real marriage or a marriage as it should happen according to Ghanaian's tradition. Uh -huh. So I, I do support some of the young women who want those services. Most of them, they're just in love. You can't tell them anything different. They know it's real. And um, my own experience, um, I've been married a little over, how many, how many years, seven? I think seven years now. And I'm saying that because I've been with my husband for a long time. Um, but part of it was because of always keeping like the one eye open. Like the, hmm, like waiting for the, waiting for the, the green card scam, let me say that. And I will say, I kind of had to learn the hard way and I wasted a lot of time. I actually do have a really good brother. It hasn't been easy culturally. Some of it has just been cultural discord. And I, I wanna give you an example. We were, we had a school. There was some pressing question about the uniform, about the color. And he asked me what color, and I said, oh, I don't care, just pick any color. So a month went by, two months went by, and I asked a question about the uniform. And he got really angry and upset. He said, but you said you didn't care. 
And so I thought myself having to explain, no, that I didn't care didn't mean I don't care. It just mean whatever choice you, you make, I'm indifferent about it. I will support you whatever when you want. That took a long time to work out. Just like that simple, the being taken literally, because you know, African Americans are very figurative in language, but um, Ghanaians and Africans are very literal in language. And so everything we do is like, like even in hip hop, everything we do, there's like an analogy for it, right? So figuring that out has been like, I would say if someone was asking me my, my number one difficult, that's my number one biggest challenge. So the support I provide is, is kind of like helping people to be successful in this very transitional space. And your age makes a very big difference of what that process looks like. Those that are 60 plus and may have pensions when they return, have a whole different lifestyle than somebody, let's say 25 to 35 that's trying to come. And just another thing. So one of the things we come as entrepreneurs. And so last, this past Thursday, I just had um, a virtual session about citizenship and residency. Most of us don't know, you really can't do, African law frowns on entrepreneurship because there's a law that says we can't engage in retail. Foreigners, it's not really about us. Foreigners can't engage in retail and most entrepreneurship endeavors because those jobs are reserved for the indigenous and the local people. So when we come over here opening up our salons, opening up our cell phone shops, all of it is against the law. And it's difficult because they'll be said, but the president said we should come. And they'll ask questions like, well, what, he, what does he want us to do when we get here? Uh-huh. So those, those things are still being worked out in terms of, of legislation. And the returning is forcing different conversations legally across the board. Everything from what is citizenship, because some of our people, just recently when our President Nana Kufo Ado was in DC, he's, do, he's given a speech, come home. And they're literally packing their bags, getting on the plane and looking for the welcoming committee and there's no welcoming committee. So with that, I am an executive board member now of the African American Association of Ghana. And one of the things that we do is try to assist um, our people to have a soft landing. But even that organization, which is 30 years young, the objectives and the vision and the mission is evolving because now there's so many. And now the, the conversation has changed. It's not about us finding tribe. It's about we're here and we need help and we need support. And we need to not be taken advantage of. Um, and at the same time, we need to not come thinking, because some of us, there's, there's, this, there's this unpacking that we have to do mentally. She God, black woman is God. This is what they don't tell us. Yes, yeah, so without wasting much time, Brother Yazi will come and give us the vote of thanks. But uh, just after the vote of thanks, we all want to call ourselves and come together to have a nice group picture. Yeah, let's make some memories, you know. Thank you all. <laughs> And thank you for thank you to everybody for coming out today to uh, be a part of our Black History program. Uh, 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 let me get straight to the giving of thanks. Uh, I give thanks to the Creator, to the God, the Goddess, to our ancestors for pulling us here for a good, positive program. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. A special a special thank you to our speakers. Uh, that is. Mr. Kwame of Gaydar, Gadar, not Gaydar, Gadar. That's the uh, advocacy organization. Uh, Sister Burdell, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Akai, thank you as well. Dr. Mantukan, thank you very much. Nana, of course, our board thank you very much. Brother Kashawn Myers, thank you very much for coming to also speak. And also uh, uh, a special thank you to our host, that is uh, Franco Wusu and uh, Exodus as well. And Mr. Nee Ashite. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nee Ashite, for also being a part 
I, I really appreciate what happened today. Uh, a special thank you to my beautiful and lovely and supportive wife, Jeanette Muhammad. I could not be here and make it here without her. Jane, wherever you are, thank you very much. I love you around the world and back again. <laughs> and um, I want to say, uh, also thank the donators, those that donated to our program. I didn't put this program on by myself. Uh, I have some very angelic uh, uh, supporters that also support our study group uh, to, to, to make these programs happen. Uh, yes, I do come out of my personal pocket to put it on, but this is something I'm also very passionate about. Uh, we really want to do these type of programs and I'd rather do a program like this than do a rap show any day. So these are some of the things that I'm motivated to do. And I, you know, whether 100 people come or five people come, I'm very satisfied. I'm completely fulfilled with what happened today. I just appreciate everybody that came, the speakers that spoke from their heart, and even uh, one of the big, biggest motivations behind this theme for this program about repatriation was to begin to develop a network of those of us who offer repatriation services. So I've created a blend of uh, Ghanaians as well as African Americans that are offering these services and also to share their experiences of repatriation. I'm living my dream. This is literally, I'm living my dream. And I could see it and hear it in Kashan's voice. I could see it and hear it in Akoso's voice. I could hear it in Monte Combs. We, Verdell, I can relate to what they're saying because we have a similar experience that is the African-American experience where uh, we left a place, uh, a crabs in a barrel kind of place, if you will. Uh, when you're trying to leave out, people will be pulling on you. You shouldn't go. Why should you go? This, that, and the third. So, you know, it's great to meet a sister like uh, Coastal Boateng, and I've known her uh, online for some years now, and I've been an admirer of her work, uh, and, you know, we all want to be able to, as, as Kashawn said, uh, as we are coming through, we want to be able to pull somebody else behind us, you know, and, I, and for me, that is that these things become highly competitive. Maybe some of you may uh, uh, may have a similar uh, experience. You know, when I look at uh, Marcus Garvey, oh. his, uh, his life and the work that he did, and you like, how was he sabotaged? You look at uh, Sanji Fukuami. When the chief speaks, or when the chief bobs, as we say, the water is finished. Uh, all I want to say is that we are not alone in this movement. This repatriation, this emancipation, we are not alone. All that has been happening, all that is has certain spiritual background, spiritual support, spiritual push. You see, you just didn't get up and come to Ghana. And so I can't remember other names. But you, you didn't just get up. And you, sister, something asked you, pushed you to come. Your ancestors are still alive. We shared the story of Queen Noki. And I assure you that our ancestors are still alive and pushing us. One day, I may not be alive to see it, and you may not be alive to see it. Hundreds of years to come. But our sisters and brothers in the diaspora will come bring back knowledge and wealth to rebuild 
Africa. Replace what was taken away. I do not like referring to the Jews. Forgive me if there's a Jew here. But I don't like referring to the Jews. But Israel is great because of the Jews in the diaspora. They're everywhere. You know it. I don't have to tell you. They are making Israel great. And that is what is going to happen. It may not be tomorrow nor next year. But for sure, you can count on that. The diaspora and Africans will come back and make Africa great. Because our Africans, our uh, ancestors are behind us. It is not for nothing. Now, written somewhere. It is not for nothing that Africans are spread all over the globe. Is that not true? We are all over the globe. It is for a reason. Spirit has a way of doing its things. Thank you very much. About plans. Until later in life, he was um, recognized by the great Osage for Kwame Nkrumah to help start the first horticulture department at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Um, in addition to the botanical gardens at KNUST. He later went on to study botany in the UK and from those studies continued particularly focus on indigenous African herbs and the medicinal values. He later moved to the US, particularly to the West Coast in California. There along with his lifelong partner, Mama Kali, they developed the North Scale when Institute. Um, what when Dr. Endo is probably most, power, most famous for so is that he's credited with being Italian. the person that today, introduced Moringa. How many people know of Moringa? Anybody know Moringa? Anyone use Moringa? All right. Well, I first heard about Moringa in the United States. Achieve any positive things. We have a leaders who are thinking about themselves and family. We call them uh, domestic bourgeoisie. The leaders today are not leaders, but they are. They call themselves domestic bourgeois. So we don't need domestic bourgeoisie in Ghana now. We need a government for the people, the government who can help the people. Okay, let's say uh, our brothers from the diaspora who are now repatriating back into Africa. If you have any advice for them. Yes, what they have to do is that they have to uh, integrate with our culture and tradition so that we can grow forward. But if they come here and they call themselves African Americans, we can't cooperate. They have to cooperate with that. They have to join our culture and uh, tradition. Okay, do you think Ghana made a mistake by joining hands with the CIA to overthrow Nkrumah? It was very wrong for the Ghanaians to collaborate with the CIA to overthrow Kwame Nkrumah because Nkrumah was trying to build Africa. Then, therefore, the CIA did not agree with the Kwame Nkrumah's policy. Therefore, they joined the Ghanaian military government to overthrow Kwame Nkrumah. It was very wrong. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you as well. I have with me the managing director of Born Again Africa Ghana Soul Food and the leader of Born Again African Study Group. You're welcome, Zazi. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, today is Black Celebration Month and it's being held at a beautiful place that you've designed or you've created for Africans and black people. How do you feel organizing such a program? Oh, well, this is one of the, the stars in my crown, if you will. These are some of the passion, something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, as you know, we have something that we have been working as, a, uh, as our business and organization to try to develop. Uh, an entertainment um, center where we can invite uh, the community, the large community, to also come and participate and um, learn something as well as be entertained. Uh, as far as Black History Month, this was something I learned about in the United. I was indoctrinated in the United States, and I wanted to take an opportunity to see how it will benefit Ghanaians about building up self-esteem and black pride. So uh, one of the speakers was talking about Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and how he was overthrown. Do you think Nkrumah's impact is so huge on Africans, Americans, and African diasporans? I think um, uh, uh, Osajifo Kwame Nkrumah, his impact was more uh, 
and I learned this living in Ghana. About it was more impactful outside of Ghana than actually on maybe Ghanaians. Uh, I think uh, Kwame Nkrumah realized he was kind of speaking for the black world. That took me on a journey and that has I think in, in, uh, in the Ghana that he was trying to create, many of the people kind of dealt with uh, ethnicity rather than seeing it as a, a, a global black world. So the impact that Osajiwo had on we from the African diaspora was to open the door for coming back to Africa and saying that we um, want you also to come back to Africa. To learn about Africa so let, let's let's come back to Ghana. Most people are watching you, and you don't really understand when you talk about the Black History Month. Can you give us a brief knowledge about the Black History Month celebration? Okay. Well, Black History Month was started by uh, Dr. Cardi G. Woodson in 1926. And it started out as just one week celebration where we learn about uh, the accomplishments of black people, not just black Americans or African Americans, if you will, uh, but the global black people around the world, as many of us are disjointed. Uh, black History Week then grew and into so the month, uh, and then uh, more people were included, every year and we it became something that uh, where black people the black in black the United black States are not black. taught to be have high self-esteem. Uh, black everything, black is negative. So to see uh, black people that we can aspire to be, whether it be Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman, Osaji Fukwami Nkrumah, Ya Asantiwa. And all these people that we begin to look at and say, oh man, well, they are liberators. We have liberators in ourselves, and I want to be like him or her. Or a business person, Marcus Garvey, or an activist, you know, or a pastor or a politician. You was to see people that also advocated and worked on behalf of the larger community or the larger collective. And that is really the importance of Black History Month is to put self-esteem into the youth so that we begin to appreciate and love black pride. So in short, how do you see the year of retained? The, uh, the year of return. I'm a benefactor of the year of return in 2019 where I became a naturalized citizen Thank you, uh, President Nana Kofi Addo. I appreciate the government even acknowledging me in that way. I really saw it as a, uh, I see it as a door opening, an opportunity, be it whether the, um, the motivation behind Year of Return, if it was uh, uh, purely for money or for uh, tourism, uh, God is there. So, you know, the Creator is also working through all of us. So, though he the motivation may be for money, uh, the spirit is there to bring the right people back. So we also want to attract the right people into Ghana. So I appreciate what uh, Nana Ado is doing, and it is really spreading across the whole Africa, where other nations are inviting the diaspora to come in and be a part of the development and renaissance of Africa today. So can you can you can you uh, assure your brothers and sisters living in America who are afraid to repatriate back to Africa into Ghana? Because most people are also saying that your return is a scam. Others also have their views on it. Can you assure your brothers that your return isn't a scam and they can really repatriate to Ghana and Africa? Yes, it's not a scam in terms of to to move to. Um, to repatriate and come to Ghana or Africa, it's a real opportunity. Uh, when you come here, you know, the best thing to do is prepare yourself. If you're moving from one state to another state, prepare yourself. If you're moving across the ocean, prepare yourself. Uh, we have uh, the, organ the, the program we've organized today is about repatriation and repatriation assistance. So if you can get to uh, connect and network with somebody that can help you to better transition into Ghana, I have a business real repatriation consultation as long as, as well as with Born Again Africa to and also show you that you can uh, 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 move yourself into the community and how to network. As a brother was saying earlier, we have to network with brothers like yourself, sisters that? like herself in order to join ourselves so that we can also cover each other and help, to help us to uh, make the transition and also help you to also move up as well. Hey, finally, uh, can you give us a brief uh, advert or something about your business when you talk about Born Again Africa, what do you do and what do you sell here? Okay, Born Again Africa and Ghana Soul Food, we are the best rest stop 
in the whole eastern region and Volta region when you cross the Adomi Bridge and you're looking for a place to, uh, you're traveling to the Volta region and you need a place to ease yourself or you need a place to relax or you're looking for some food, delicious food. We have international food, that is some African American food or black American food. And we also have a lot of the uh, Ghanaian soul food as well so we invite you to come over enjoy the food also we have this beautiful venue here where you can host any kind of event wedding reception or programs like this or birthday parties we can fill and fit any type of program into our space so you're all invited to come and join us Thank you very much. Thank you too. Okay, from Samuel Yansaka, you know, back when seven Exodus, now about a couple of four, you know, we are met translating via and switching. My brother, we are welcome to Foka TV. Thank you, Mr. Foka. It's been a long time. Yeah, you know, times and times differences. You know. Okay. So. Today is a Black History Month celebration, and you are part of the program today. True. Let's talk about black business. How is black business doing in Africa? Yeah, black business for me, I see, I think it's it's really doing good. You know, because we cannot be ungrateful. Yeah, but first of all, you see, let me talk a small thing about the the Black History Month. The Black History Month was created from the from from Europe. Yeah, because for for, for over years that they've been enslaved, they were not allowed to read or to study about their own root and culture. So this month has been accepted. You know, nationally, you know, that during that time they can we can sit and talk. Black man can also talk about his root and his culture. Yeah. So coming to the black business here in Ghana, for me, I'm a business personnel. Okay. Yeah, I've been, I, 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 I've, I've attended school a little bit, but I've not really put all my my mind on the on what I've learned from from the uh, the educational system because it's feeling I, I found it feeling more of, more of the youth. Okay. So I found the other way around to survive by doing creativity. Okay. Yeah, by making sandals using using making sanders from spoiled and spoiled conveyor belt and car ties and you know I found a way of making time that I, I was I was taught how to make time die by an old lady you know so I also opened myself up out to the universe to give me people that can Im have impact on my life and I'm really having them one day and one day in day out so business in Ghana here yeah, I see it's, it's, it's very motivation and, and fruitful if you are doing it from your heart everything that you do they will, they will buy everything that you sell they will buy everything that you create they will buy supposing you put in love for it you put in love and passion for it you know yeah thank you very much my brother thank you one love I for the diacosia ni pretty, Hannah, my crying, my two midi, Jimmy, and to eighty me a sea, a day a mouth. I ought to say a name, a hoof will be a casa casa, guess because I'm on the casa, you may as well say any beans on eighty me a casa, not just say. And the black man story, no, they say at Impoku, and so when I to me a day a bro, what to me say, and yah, as I'm kitchen, I'm reading at a Frank was who could be a me from Jackie Boy, Dublin Jackson, name it DOP, I name on our son, it's me Buama, a driver, Eddie Miffy Accra. So Eddie will do at him book and say, Sewa need to key and so no a total liable nominee bomb be at him a conkind. Yamia Doma, Ibisha Macram, Menko Bibia.